Our Father, we do thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for presenting your word to us as your truth. And we uh, pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith in your word uh, as you increase our trust in you and that we would find in it um, a reliable source uh, of your revelation of yourself. Through it, we may know you and uh, so live meaningful lives and profitable lives in this world. We lift all these things up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, this will be the last in our series. Uh, I think we'll be wrapping it up here. I want to talk about, um, first of all, some of the so-called problems of biblical chronology. Uh, this comes from um, ministers, theologians, and uh, you know various people's opinions within churches, and that is that... Um, that you can't depend upon biblical chronology because it's, it's uh, not meant to be for historical recording. Uh, and if it's not meant for historical recording, then you don't rely upon it as historical recording. And so there could be a lot more uh, names in a genealogical list uh, that just don't show up because it's... It's uh, abbreviated, um, so they're, and you know, usually they don't say there's too many names, you know, in it. They just say there are not, uh, there's probably not enough names, I've, you know, that there are, that any genealogical list is incomplete, and uh, there are lots of other uh, names in there that never got put into it. Um, there's absolutely no evidence that that is true, um, that there are other names that have been left out uh, of the genealogical list. Uh, that is pure speculation, and it's based on a, an illogical uh, reasoning, and that is that you can't use the genealogies for historical purposes because the genealogies are not put there for historical purposes. And there's two things wrong with that. Number one, if it wasn't for, for historical purposes, it certainly serves that purpose. All right? I mean, so the genealogical records are extremely precise at, in their presentation. So they have the nature of being used for historical purposes. Now, on the other hand, the king's list of Egypt is about the sloppiest record you're going to find for running from one king to another and through, G and through various dynasties of kings and so forth without any clear indication or continuity in them that you're dealing with uh, a straight line of kings or whether there's co-regnalism going on there or whether there is a split in Egypt north and south where both of them are going at the same time, which has been put this way, and yet it's considered a reliable historical record. So it's a spurious argument, a very spurious argument. Um, that the genealogies of the Bible cannot be used for historical purposes. Actually, it's absolutely ridiculous. Even if it, the, the, the record was missing names, it would still be better than the, than the Egyptology, than Egyptology's king's list. By far better than the king's list, which is considered historical. Okay? So I'm not saying that the king's list is not historical. It is. But if it's historical, how much more is the Bible historical? All right, Because it has a genealogy that spreads over uh, a period of about 3,500 plus years. All right, And uh, actually 4,000 years if you just go right straight to the book of Luke. But... Um, uh, but it, for a, a period of about 3,500 uh, 3, years, 
you have a continual genealogy from creation all the way to the end of the theocracy. All right, so, um, and not only that, but it is a tight genealogy. Uh, it is a father-son genealogy. And you can't get around that either, especially when you've got two or three versions of it, and each one of them in different ways are saying, so-and-so is the son of so-and-so is the son of so-and-so, or it'll reverse it and say, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, who is the father of so-and-so, who is the father of so-and-so, all right? Now, some of the... Um, some of the arguments that come up against the accuracy of uh, the genealogical uh, records in the Bible are Matthew's, uh, and the big one is Matthew's genealogy of Christ. And Matthew's genealogy of Christ is not complete. It is not a complete genealogy. All right, There are some names missing, but it's not meant to be complete. It's meant to lay out three dispensations. One from Abraham to David. That is from covenant to monarchy. And so 14 names are given between. The other is from David or from the beginning of the monarchy to the exile, the Babylonian exile, that is from the beginning of the theocracy to its end. And the third is from the exile to Christ. 14, 14, 14. This is what's important in Matthew's in Matthew's genealogy of Christ, which is why it's not the only genealogy of Christ there is. <laughs> this is a covenantal representation of the genealogy of Christ. All right, The true genealogy of Christ is in Luke. All right, And it is complete. This one's missing some names. And it's very interesting the names that are missing. The names that are missing from this in the king's list is Ahaziah, uh, Joash, which is a very inter interesting one to be missing because he had prophecies made about him and Amaziah. If you read about these three guys right here, you know what you'll find out? you'll find out that they are all um, descendants of Ahab and Jezebel. In other words, this rotten line right here got into the Jewish kings. And so, under the inspiration of Scripture, Matthew excommunicated them from Israel. <laughs> Boom. He kicked them out. And, um, well, he should have. These were, these were apostates. <laughs> and they, they brought great danger to the kingdom. You remember the story of Athaliah? Joash was just... Athaliah was the wife of Ahaz, Ahaziah, the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. All right? Jerobo, uh, um, Je uh, Jehoram's wife was Athaliah. Okay, and when Ahaziah died, she killed all of his sons off except for Joash, who was hidden away. All right, and Joash grew up, and the priest killed had Athaliah killed and put Joash up as king. Joash apostatized and actually killed that priest's son, Zechariah, and Amaziah came up after him. And uh, Ahaziah, Joash, and, and Jehoram are all three names that were names of descendants of Ahab who were kings of Israel. So they were actually naming their sons after each other. 
All right? There was a real close relationship going on here. This was a rotten time. And it's excised out of Matthew's, uh, Matthew's genealogy. And it's done for covenant reasons. All right? Now, <clears throat> get this. We know these guys are missing. Why? Why do we know they're missing from the, the list in Matthew? Because they're in other genealogies, okay? So we have. A, so does the, does Matthew's genealogy tell us we have incomplete genealogy in the Bible? No. <laughs> if I know who's missing here, and I get this from another list, and actually two or three other lists, <laughs> then I know what I've got, and these other ones line up with each other. And the fact that they line up with each other, the one in, first, in, in uh, Kings, the one in Chronicles, and the, and the one in Luke, the fact that these all line up with each other indicates to me that it's important in Scripture to have a complete genealogy, especially when you look at the genealogy in the Antediluvian and the patriarchs right afterward, and you see it makes no bones about who is whose son. Now the word, Ben, Bar, they can be used for grandson, descendant, seed, this kind of thing. But if you've got those words being used in a king's list or, or in, a, in a genealogical list, and they're saying this guy had this son when he was 35 years old, he's not talking about his grandson. <laughs> He's talking about his son. And if every one of them says that same thing and then goes on to say, and then he lived 490 years afterwards, okay, then we're talking about precision here. Now, if you want a comparison of that, compare the genealogy of, um, of uh, Adam all the way through to Noah to the genealogy of Cain and his descendants, all right? And you want a, an incomplete genealogy? There's your one right there. We have no idea how to date that one. And we don't even know for sure who's whose son in it or grandson or whatever. It is a sloppy genealogy. And so is Esau's. Esau's genealogy gets totally confusing. After a while, you don't know who you're looking at here. Who are these people? Who's, the, who's this guy and who's this, you know, Duke so-and-so and all this kind of stuff? It, it, it goes completely into chaos. Why? Why is it that those genealogies go into chaos? Because they are the genealogies of the reprobates. <laughs> the genealogy is teaching you this. These people go off into history and become forgotten. These are remembered because the, this line right here is going to remain pure so that we can show the Gentiles one of these days that we can trace Jesus all the way back to Adam and to be able to say that Adam, that Jesus was the son of so-and-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-so-
How important was it to them in that day to have an unbroken pedigree all the way back to the beginning? Extremely important. How important is that for Christ to claim to be king, priest, and prophet? Extremely important. Therefore, we can say that this genealogy is absolutely accurate. All right. Now there's one more thing. <clears throat> um, and that is in... Well, I don't have my Bible with me. In the genealogy of uh, coming out of the flood from Seth to Abraham. I don't know whether it's Seth to Abraham. Yeah, from Seth to Abraham. There is an extra person in, in that line in the New Testament. Somebody give me a Bible. I don't want to do this without. Thank you. I want to get this right. I should have written this down, but I forgot. Um, Luke's genealogy is chapter... Chapter 3. All right, yeah. Uh, Luke's genealogy going back to um, verse 36. Uh, it started out in 23. Jesus uh, was uh, the son of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mathat, blah, 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 all the way down to 36. Son of Canaan, son of Arphaxad, son of Shem, son of Noah, son of Lamech, etc., etc. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Notice that it says, son of Canaan, son of Arphaxad, son of Shem. All right? Now, if you go back in the uh, genealogy in Gen Genesis chapter 10, and look at Shem. It says, Shem was the father of... Uh, the sons of Shem were... No, no, that's the wrong one. It's the one before that. It's the, no, it's the one after that. Uh, Eleven. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old. He fathered Arphaxad and lived to be 500 years old. Our fact shed lived 35 years. He fathered Shelah. Now compare that to the one in Luke. In Luke it's Shem, our fact said, Canaan, and Shelah. In the Old Testament, it's Shem, our fact said, and Shelah. Canaan's missing in the Old Testament. All right, now that's weird. How is he missing in the Old Testament but shows up in the New? The answer to that is a little bit complicated. And it is that the text of the Hebrew text of your scripture, which is called Masoretic, is not as accurate as the Septuagint, the Greek version. Because the Greek version is much older than the Masoretic Hebrew text. The Masoretic Hebrew text first appears somewhere around the 5th century A.D. The uh, Septuagint goes back to about the 2nd and possibly 3rd century B.C. The Septuagint. The Septuagint in the Old Testament contains the name Canaan in Greek. So, we have an older Old Testament record that has that name in it. And obviously, the writers of the New Testament are using the Septuagint. Most of your direct quotations in Greek come straight out of the Septuagint. Exact wording and everything. That's why you find these little differences in uh, an Old Testament uh, passage being used in the New Testament. Now, sometimes in the New Testament, uh, they will 
uh, paraphrase it in, so that it changes pronouns so that it's no longer saying something in the future is going to happen to them, but they'll say, this is happening to you. And so they'll change it over so that it becomes applicable in that time. And they do that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Actually, very few qu Old Testament quotations are actually quotations. Most of them are uh, transliterations. And... Uh, but still, when they are a transliteration, they still use the same Greek syntax as if they're copying it right out of the Septuagint. So, the Septuagint is very, very important. So once again, we have a name. It's not added in the New Testament. It just simply got dropped in the Masoretic text. Why? We don't know. We have no idea why it was dropped or how it got missing somehow or another. <clears throat> but we can go back earlier and find it. Uh, actually, and this is a little off subject, you can, you can correct things in your Old Testament that, that are translated out of the Masoretic text by going to the Septuagint and finding out what it says. I'll give you a, a classic example. In your Old Testament, it tells you that from the time that... Um, Jacob went down to Egypt to the time of the Exodus was 430 years. That's what the Masoretic says. The Septuagint says that from the time that Jacob sojourned and went down to Egypt was a period of 430 years. And, and um, Paul backs this up in Galatians 3 when he says, from the time of the giving of the covenant to the giving of the law, that is from Abraham to Exodus, was 430 years. Which means they spent how much time in Egypt? 215 years. And that fits, that fits the generations because it was four generations who were in, in there during that 215-year period of time. Four generations. Just like God said there would be to Abraham. He said, for four generations you will be in Egypt and then I will come and bring you out. Four generations over 430 years, not likely. But see... Also, there are those who say, well, if they were in Egypt for 430 years and only four generations, there are some generations missing there. No, there's not. And in fact, we have uh, four or five generations in Egypt given to us from, from various tribes, Levi, Judah, um, Manasseh, I think, and one, one other one. All of them are in the four generation range, every one of them. And they're consistent all the way through. Now to span that period of time, those men would have to live a long time. What's the big deal there? <laughs> People were living that long a lot back in those days. All they would have to do is be able to live on the average 110 years, have children late in life. It happened. It happened a lot. So. It's not an unusual situation. Um, so it kind of sets things straight for us, it, you know, where, where somebody is, is saying, you know, and, and besides which, if the Bible is not to be taken seriously in its genealogy, why does it go to so much trouble to make it so precise? Why? And if it's precise for reasons of pedigree for those people in those days to be able to verify their line, then it's really accurate. And in spite of the fact that God may not have said back then uh, in the early days, uh, y'all keep really good records of your pedigree and everything, but don't ever use this for historical reasons. You know, some, some woman in a little house out on the prairie back in the 1800s uh, 
you know, writes a letter to some people in the East and says, well, you know, we got attacked by Indians today and da 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 and all this kind of stuff. But don't use this for historical records. And this, it's a silly argument. We use all kinds of things for historical records. If they're appropriate to be used, we use. So why, why do we say, why, do, why are there those who are saying you can't use the Bible for that reason? All right. Well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You'll have to ask them because I don't know the answer. So, um, you know, if, if the Bible's chronology were not complete, we wouldn't even know that Matthew's account is symbolic. <laughs> we wouldn't know what to do with Matthew's account. It is because it's accurate that we know that Matthew didn't mean it to be an accurate account but that he meant it to be a symbolic account. But if there had been no accuracy to measure that by, we couldn't say this. In fact, we couldn't say anything. The only thing we would be able to say is, well, Matthew was wrong. The Bible is in error. So it's because of the accuracy of the genealogy that we're able to say, there's nothing wrong with what Matthew said. He wanted a nice 14, 14, 14. That's what he got, okay? And he did it by excommunicating some reprobates. <laughs> Fine, everything's good, you know? It's easy enough. So, um, you know, can we trust the Bible? Yeah, we can trust the Bible. We don't have any problems with that. The, you know, here's the question. Does the Bible throw out lists that are somewhat random sometimes? That really the list is what's important, not the elements in the list? Yeah, the Bible does that sometimes. That's not evidence that it does it all the time. But it does it sometimes. I'll give you an example. Revelation 7, 5 through 8. <clears throat> and this is about the 144,000 which they are 144,000, which breaks down into 12 twelves, right? 12 patriarchs, 12 tribes. And then he lists off the tribes. And look at this list. There's something wrong with this list, if you look at it carefully. Judah, that's okay. Reuben, Gad, good. Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi. What's he doing in there? Now, if you know anything about Levi, you know that he was pulled out from among the 12 patriarchs in order to be God's own possession. And in fact, God bought him with money. He bought the whole tribe of Levi with money. And they became his possession from then on. And from then on, they're not counted with the 12 because they're special. They're kind of like Paul, okay, you know. Uh, he's a different kind of apostle, all right? Levi is a different kind of tribe. It's God's own possession. It's his own servants. It's his representatives in the religion and in all of the administration of the religion. So Levi shouldn't be in this list, all right? Issachar, fine. Zebulun. Joseph, whoa. Joseph's not in the list of the 12 tribes because when... When Jacob took Ephraim and Manasseh and brought them to him and crossed his hands over and blessed them, you know what he did? He said, they're mine now. And when he said, they're mine now, he was saying, Joseph, you're out. And your sons are going to take your place in the list and Levi's place because Levi is out now. And you know what that makes? Twelve tribes, all right? Twelve tribes. So Ephraim and Manasseh should be in there. There's no Ephraim on this list. And then Benjamin, all right? Two names are missing, Ephraim and Dan. Dan's not on the list. Now, that's a whole tribe, <laughs> you know, and just left out. Why was Dan left out? 
Why was Ephraim left out and Joseph put in and Levi? Ephraim and Manasseh become tribes among the twelve, but Dan wasn't exed out. Joseph is not mentioned. There are no Josephites. All right, there are Benjamites, but there are no Josephites. And the Levites have been set to the side. So the 12 tribes, the 12 patriarchal tribes, uh, have been rearranged. All right? Um, kind of like when uh, with the uh, apostles. When Judas is out, then Matthias comes in. All right? And then you've got another one who's off to the side, the one who is dealing with the Gentiles, Paul, who's, who calls himself the one born out of time. All right. Um, what's the significance of this? There really isn't any. This is supposed to be taken as a list. All right. If you want the real list, go to another place in the Bible. There are plenty of places where you'll find the true list of Israel. This one is not it. This one right here is prophetically symbolic prophetically symbolic. Because if you think about it, uh, whether you believe that Revelation was written for 70 A.D. period or whether you believe that Revelation was written for the end of the world, the one thing both, of you, uh, both views have to admit is there are no 12 tribes. Okay? <laughs> are there 12 tribes today? No, there's no 12 tribes today. Now, in this day, were there 12 tribes? No, there weren't 12 tribes. Now, there were a few representatives of tribes within Judah at that time, in Judea at that time. We know that there, was an Is there were some Issacharites. We know that there were Benjamites. Paul was one. Uh, we know that there were Simeonites. And we know that there were Levites. But we don't know whether there was anybody else, any representatives of any other ones. And all of them were Jews. In other words, they had all become Jews. So that uh, Paul could call himself a Jew even though he was a Benjamite. Or he could, he could call, or James in his epistle could call Ju Judah the 12 tribes of Israel. Either way. Either way. All right. And so... Basically, this list there is to say all of God's people. All of God's people. That's what it's there for. The 144,000, it's not meant to be literal. Any more than this list, list is meant to be literal. All right? Because if you want to make this list right here literal, you're going to be going against the Old Testament. All right? So it's not meant to be used that way. So, you know, that's, those, are kind, those kinds of things are things that we have to look carefully at when we're reading the Bible. How is this, uh, what, what is uh, the usage of this? Is it exact? Does it have that kind of exactitude? Or is this uh, very loose like with Matthew and, what, and like with this list here in, in Revelation? And once again, we're not coming off the rails when we do that because the rails are already set. All right? It's like they say in most things, you know, like uh, uh, learning poetry or, or music or something like that. Learn the rules so that, the, so that you can learn how to break them. Okay? First get the rules down. And then you can play with it. You can play, you can play around with, with uh, uh, poetic license or... Uh, you know, doing theme and variation or whatever those kinds of things is. The Bible sets these straight paths. And then, you know, every now and then it'll throw out something that is representative. And it's obviously representative because you take a look at it and you go, well, you know, that list, that doesn't look right, you know. There's something missing on that. It's kind of like the seven dwarfs, you know, if you're trying to, you know, always, it's, Sneezy, I can't remember. That's the one I never can remember, you know. <clears throat> and the 12 tribes are mentioned in the New Testament. Acts 26, 7 says, The promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God day and night and day for this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews, says Paul when he is uh, facing Agrippa, James 1, 1, uh, and so on. Um, but, you know, remember, there are no 12 tribes. 
In Paul's day, there are no 12 tribes. There's just Judah. That's all. <laughs> the other tribes have been lost. They're gone. And yet prophecy goes on saying, Israel this and Israel that and Israel the other thing. So what happens to Israel? Israel is reduced down to Judah. And that is covenantal. Because originally Israel was a guy by the name of Jacob. That's the original Israel. And then there were 12 guys who came out of him who were Israel. And then there was a whole nation that came out of him that was called Israel. And then there was only one tribe, Judah, which is called Israel. And finally, in the end, there's only one man left, Jesus, who is called Israel. And he is called Israel. Isaiah calls him Israel in the prophecy. And he is all of Israel that's left. Starts with one man, ends with one man, Israel. And when it ends with Israel, and when Israel ends with Jesus, all of the promises are given to him. All of them are given to him. He becomes the guarantor of the entire covenant. And he may dispense with it as he pleases. All right? So Jesus is Israel. That's what it all came down to. All coming down to this focal point. And it always was heading for that focal point. That's the whole point of the Old Testament. Starts out wide and gets really narrow before it's over with. And Jesus is the one who is focused there. Okay. Um, one more thing, and this, this will be fun. Now in this book right here, which I, read, which I wrote because it's got my name on it down there and has a really pretty co uh, cover right here, you know, the, the night light there from outer space, all right, which symbolizes God's light coming on and beginning to <laughs> spread across the globe. Ha! <laughs> okay. So anyway, have fun with that, with the cover, and then after that you can read the book. Um, but there's one section in it on pages 59 and 60, and it is a chart here. And I think you'll find this interesting. It's very general, very, very general. Because you could write hundreds and hundreds of pages on this chart right here. What this chart does is this. All right, now you, you have your sheet which has 16 flood elements, right? And that's just the 16 ones that I could think of off, off the top of my head, all right? But there are actually many more than that. All right, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Let's, let's see whether the Bible can be trusted or whether we need to trade it in for the epic of Gilgamesh, okay? <laughs> the whole Bible, just trade it in and just make a religion out of the epic of Gilgamesh, all right? What you see here are elements of the flood. When you read the account of the flood, it, it says different things like God did it because man had become extremely violent and was corrupt. Uh, the wrath of God was heating up as we see in chapter 6. Uh, there was only one good man uh, that could be found. Uh, he was told to build an ark. You could even add to the, to the list. He was given specific instructions on how to do that. Uh, there were eight people who went into the ark, or at least there was a man and wife who went into the ark. There were animals that went in by twos or sevens, all right, um, twos and or sevens. Uh, there was rain that came down for 40 days and night, or at least days and nights, days and nights. That's very, in, that's very important, days and nights. You know, we don't say that anymore. Said, well, it rained all day. Why, didn't, why don't we say, well, it rained all day and night. It rained three days and nights, you know. 
But back in, the, back in those days, you spoke in that language, morning and evening, days and nights. Uh, fountains of the deep broke up. Mountains were covered. All living creatures died. A wind crank came across the earth and began to dry it up. The ark lands on top of a mountain. Pilot birds, raven and or dove, and sometimes another kind of bird. Olive branch, sacrifice afterwards, a vineyard and drunkenness, and a rainbow, and a covenant. Okay, and Actually, you can add quite a few other things to that list. You're going to find these elements here in flood myths all over the world. Flood myths are incredibly ubiquitous. You find them in every culture. You find them everywhere. You find them in Norse mythology. You find them in Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Assyriological, Egyptological, Oceania, South America, Olmec, Toltec, Zapotec, Aztec. There's no place, China, and not just one in China, but many in China in various provinces. Different, you know, all of these flood, uh, all of these have this flood myth. All right, it's a, it is as ubiquitous as dragons. Okay, it's everywhere. It's all over the world. Tons and tons and tons of material are available on flood myths, and in all of those flood myths, or almost all of them, you're going to find one two, three, maybe five of these elements in every one of them. You're going to find these elements in them. Now here's what you're going to find. Let's say, let's say uh, here's a flood myth, 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 here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, you're going to find element number one here, you're going to find three here, you're going to find uh, two here, you're going to find five here, you're going to find 11 here, 16 here, 10, 9, 8, whatever. And maybe you'll find one and two here, or maybe you'll find 11 through 15 here, or whatever. But you're going to find particles of the myths all in these myth stories. All right? So you gather all these together, and you know what you get? you get the whole story. You get the whole true story if you pull these elements out all over here. All right. There's only one place where you'll find all of those elements in one place in the Bible. Now you think about that and you think about it real good because that demands a conclusion and I mean it demands a conclusion. And that is, that is the source. It has to be the source. <laughs> the Epic of Gilgamesh cannot be the source. It only has 11 through 15. Actually, it doesn't have that many. In fact, the Epic of Gilgamesh has less elements in it than some of them in the, that, that are in Bushmen, or Ashanti, or among the Aborigines in, in Australia. Some of theirs are better. Cheyenne myths, Sioux myths, Lakota myths are better than the Babylonian myth. They're closer. And some of the, and some of the terminology that's used is even biblical, like days and nights. It rained seven days and se seven nights, or it rained ten days and ten nights, all right? Just the days and nights cadence is there as if it was a song at one time, all right? Numbers like 7, 40, those are there. The people who are on the ark. Sometimes the name actually is stuck, like Noah, who shows up in Chaldean in West Chinese under that name. And as a matter of fact, 
one of the creation goddesses of China, of, of one province of China, as is Nua. And she and her husband survived the flood together. Okay? Um, the curse on the ground being lifted. You see that in Persian Hindu. The flood brought about, about, uh, about by violence. Lithuania, Lisu, and many others. Um, the ark. The Greeks, the Britons, the Romans, Chaldeans, the Rostrians, the Hindu, the Veal, the Kamar of central India. All of them have arks. The dimensions of the arks being uh, the ark being given. It may not be the dimensions in the Bible, but it is a very, very um, detailed dimension of the Bible being given. And some of the dimensions are right, whereas others are not. All right. Greeks, Chaldeans, Chinese, the Hindu. A universal flood. Greeks, Celtic, Britain, Egyptian, Chaldean, Southwest Tanzania, Yoruba, Kamchadeo, Bamar, Lisu, the Southwest Chinese. Repopulation of the earth, almost the same list. Pairs of animals taken. Britain, Assyria, Sumeria, Chaldean, Tanzania, Banar, Lolo. Uh, seeds for planting later, China and Burma, Myanmar. Duration of the flood, most of the accounts have a duration that are given. They vary, but they have similar elements to it. Groundwater coming up, Persia and Hindu. Names of the sun, Shemham and Japheth, Chaldean. Mountains covered, almost all of them. Um, pilot birds. Assyrian, Chaldean, Tanzanian, Kamar, Banar. You know, some of these are far flung from each other. Oceania to Africa to India to the Middle East. Sacrifice after Greek, Assyrian, Sumerian, Chaldeans. Rainbow. Several of them. Mostly American Indian. <laughs> All right? That's the only place where you're going to find them all. In other words, they're telling the story right. They have elements of it, but their corruptions have entered into it as well. But you can easily pick the elements out, very easily pick them out. But this is the only source that gives it with all those elements. That is undeniably, logically, that is the only source. That is the original source. Now, that may or may not have been written down at the time that these people picked it up and made their songs out of it, which I'm sure they did. Uh, I would say it probably was. In some forms or another it was, but also the oral traditions of those days, which were songs, uh, were you know, kept oral traditions for a long time. You know, there are songs that are being sung uh, in the Middle East by certain peoples to this day which have not changed one bit in 3,000 years. Not one word. Oral tradition is extremely accurate. And it's especially accurate back in these days. All right, If you go and tabulate up all of those uh, patriarchs in the antediluvian period and you overlap all of their lives with each other, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that up till the up till the time that Lamech was about Lamech the 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 uh, father of Noah was about fifty or sixty years old, almost all of the patriarchs were still alive all the way back to Abraham or all the way back to Adam. Now, how much how good is that kind of oral tradition? That's good oral tradition. That means you've still got the original people alive who can attest to the catechism. All right? So, you know, there was not a whole lot of need to record all of those things, although I'm sure they did, but there was not a whole lot of need to record all those things when Adam's still alive almost a thousand years later. All you got to do is just go back to Adam and say, Adam, you know, what do you think about that? No, you got it wrong. Change, change your pronouns around, you know, whatever. <laughs> Straighten that out a little bit. This phrase comes before that one, you know. Oh, by the way, and I'm going to end with this. 
Um, the Greeks uh, have about three versions of the flood, and in one of their versions of the flood, their great, um, their great flood hero, his name is Deucalion. Deucalion. All right. You know what that means? It means, let's see, separates out right here. It means new wine, because this word right here is, is uh, the cognate of glucose, okay? New wine, and glucose was their word for new wine, all right? New wine. Sailor. That's what Deucalion means. Remember? Noah got drunk <laughs> off of new wine. And he was a sailor. In other words, drunken sailor. So <laughs> And that's Noah. All right. That's Noah. Um, we could do that with several names that are given. By the way, uh, wherever a name is given, usually it contains one of the elements. This one contains two. <laughs> Sailor, and he keeps a vineyard. All right. 